Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for tonight's edition of HR Mentorship Learning Series. Tonight, our facilitator is Alaji Ahmed Ladangobil and is a fellow of the Charal Institute of Personnel Management of Nigeria and also a fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Management. He is the group GM and senior HR business partner commercial and anglophone Dangote Cement PLC. For tonight, we'll keep the introduction short so that we can enter straight into this session. I'll hand over control of this meeting to Ahmed Gobel. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jimmy, and thank you for having me um, again. Thank you, uh, distinguished HR professional colleagues for joining the call. I see on the call um, our colleagues in the CIPM, um, Adeyemiya Jaichi, DOBHC, uh, Dr. Charles Ugu, uh, Sabi Usani Alcantara, and a host of others. Thank you all for joining the, the call. Uh, today or tonight, we'll be speaking to ourselves um, about outsourcing as a business model in 21st century Nigeria and the challenges. Um, around the outsourcing business in Nigeria. Uh, we have tried to outline our discussion around what outsourcing is, the importance of outsourcing in the 21st century. Um, we'll be looking at an overview of outsourcing trends globally. Who are the major players and industries in the outsourcing business in Nigeria? Um, what are the advantages of outsourcing in today's globalized environment? Uh, what are the industrial and labor relations issues um, around outsourcing? What are those human resource management issues related to outsourcing? We'll look at the general challenges of outsourcing in Nigeria. Uh, we will also look at strategies for outcoming, sorry, for overcoming sourcing challenges in Nigeria. We'll be looking at emerging trends um, in the outsourcing business in Nigeria, and opportunities for growth and innovation and then a call to action for stakeholders. And then of course, we'll draw um, our conclusions and we'll take question and answers um, eventually. Now, outsourcing basically is the practice of contracting out certain business functions or processes to external parties, rather than handling them internally within the organization. Now, uh, these functions of course can range from manufacturing, IT services, of course, to customer support and to human resource management. Um, it is typically done uh, by most organizations with a view to either reducing costs, of course, accessing or leveraging specialized skills or resources. Um, sometimes it is, it is done or businesses embark on outsourcing to improve efficiency or to allow organizations to focus on their core competencies. Now, the importance of outsourcing in the 21st century, of course, revolves around cost efficiency. Uh, organizations, of course, um, outsource some of their, uh, their, their businesses or some part of their businesses uh, for them to be able to, say, access specialized skills and resources at a very lower cost. Um, rather than, of course, maintaining this uh, functions uh, or this um, part of their business, you know, in-house. Now, this cost savings, of course, can sometimes be significant, uh, particularly, of course, for non-core uh, functions. Now, another reason, of course, why organizations outsource, like we said earlier on, is to access specialized skills. And this is because um, in a rapidly evolving global economy, such as, I mean, such as the one that Nigeria is playing in, certain skills and expertise may be scarce, or they may even be expensive to hold in-house. So outsourcing as a business model, of course, enables organizations to tap into this global talent pool and, of course, access specialized skills that may not be readily available to them within their business or internally. Um, it also allows businesses to focus on their core business activities and core area of competence. So you have businesses outsourcing core functions, of course, such as IT support, such as customer service, such as accounting, 
you know, and they can then redirect their energy and their resources and attention towards those activities and those functions, of course, that contribute, you know, to their core business objectives uh, without the distraction of, you know, uh, managing for themselves um, the uh, non-core functions in their businesses. Now, this enables them, of course, to focus their attention, of course, on enhanced competitiveness and also helps them to drive innovation. Now, how has the trend been globally? Um, you'll find that there have been a shift towards strategic partnerships. Now, while organizations are increasingly, of course, moving away from traditional and transactional outsourcing arrangements, uh, they are now going into strategic partnerships with outsourcing providers. Now, these partnerships oftentimes, of course, focus on long-term rather than short-term collaboration. It focuses on innovation and, of course, focuses on value creation, you know, uh, between the outsourcing partner and the business rather than just focusing on uh, cost reduction. Of course, we've spoken about the focus on core competencies. Um, um, also, I mean, organizations now look for specialized service providers uh, so that they can focus on their core areas of competence and their strategic uh, uh, priorities. The essence of this, of course, is to drive, you know, their desire to improve on efficiency, uh, to drive agile functioning, and of course, to drive competitiveness for them in their business. There's also the rise of digital outsourcing. Uh, digital transformation is reshaping the outsourcing landscape um, such that with growing demand for digital services such as cloud computing, such as data analytics, cyber security, AI, um, organizations, of course, are now leveraging outsourcing partners to access these advanced digital capabilities and to drive innovation in their respective uh, businesses and organizations. Now, this slide is looking at the historical context of outsourcing in Nigeria. And we have tried to start, of course, from the pre-independence area, I mean, era. Uh, at this time, uh, the focus was primarily, primarily on agricultural production and trade. And even at that time, uh, um, you have people engaged in agricultural pro uh, production, of course, outsourcing even the cultivation of their farmland to so people who are ready to hire their labor for such services. Now, then, of course, we have the post-independence industrialization period, which was a period that saw the emergence of manufacturing industries in Nigeria. Now, and such industries started off by outsourcing services like transportation and logistics. Then came, of course, the oil boom and government dependency era in Nigeria. The economy, of course, of Nigeria became heavily reliant on oil exports, just as it is now, of course, leading to the neglect of other sectors like agriculture, um, like manufacturing, and of course, minimal outsourcing activities then continue outside the oil industry. Fast forward to the structural adjustment uh, program era, um, where, of course, the program aimed to liberalize the economy and of course, to privatize state-owned enterprises and of course, promote private sector participation. Um, during this period, uh, we also witnessed outsourcing some core areas of businesses that were being privatized uh, uh, or commercialized as the case may be uh, during uh, the era of structural adjustment program. Now, telecommunications and ICT revolution led to increased outsourcing of IT services. We had call centers. We now have business process outsourcing activities happening within uh, the business environment. And this was often, of course, driven by the growing demand for skilled labor by businesses and, of course, for a lot more cost-effective solutions uh, to, for managing their businesses. Uh, uh, and the sixth, of course, is globalization and outsourcing trend. Now, these as we will see, has led to the emergence of outsourcing hubs in major cities like Lagos, like Abuja, like Port Harcourt, like Kano, you know, and a host of other cities in Nigeria. Now, this house outsourcing hub now cater to both domestic and international um, clients. And out here in Nigeria, of course, 
we have domestic outsourcing, local outsourcing companies, as well as international outsourcing companies operating within the Nigerian business landscape. Then we have government initiatives and policies. These initiatives, of course, such as the national outsourcing policy and the establishment of outsourcing parks aimed to promote outsourcing as a strategic economic activity and to attract investments in the outsourcing sector uh, in Nigeria. <laughs> Now, what is the current state of the outsourcing industry in, in Nigeria? Um, it is a growing market uh, and it has steadily, you know, continued to witness growth. Now, this growth, of course, has been driven by factors such as globalization, which we spoke, to, we spoke about earlier, digital transformation, and of course, the increasing need for cost-effective business solutions. Now, um, there is now a rising demand for services of outsourcing companies by various sectors, including IT, including business process outsourcing, including HR, legal um, outsourcing, um, businesses, customer service, and even facility management. Now, we've spoken about the emerging hubs that we have around Lagos, around Abuja, around Borakot, around uh, Kano which of course now attracts both domestic and international uh, outsourcing companies. Now, this is happening because these cities offer a very conducive business environment. These cities also have very large skilled workforce. And of course, they also have the infrastructure necessary for the successful operation of the outsourcing uh, businesses. In the country. Now you have a diversified service offering. Uh, the industry in Nigeria now offers a wide range of services. Like we said earlier, including IT, data entry, payroll process, recruitment process outsourcing, facility management, legal process outsourcing, as we had mentioned um, earlier on. So organizations and businesses um, in various sectors are now leveraging outsourcing opportunities and outsourcing um, uh, companies to support them to improve efficiency in their, in their businesses, to reduce costs and to enable them, of course, focus on the core business functions of the organization. Now, um, this slide looks at some of the major players and industries engaged in outsourcing in Nigeria, and it's around in businesses in information technology area, those in the business process outsourcing, those in facility. management, those in HR and recruitment processing providers, and of course, even legal processing outsourcing firms like Alliance Law, like Standing Law, and like Konoka Associates, and a host of um, others. The details, of course, we'll see uh, when the coordinator, in fact, shares the slide um, with participants. Now, has there been some advantages, of course, to outsourcing in today's globalized environment? The answer, of course, is yes. We're talking about cost efficiency. Now, this cost savings, we said, can be sometimes very significant, and particularly in labor-intensive functions, such as IT services, customer support, and back office operations. Now, um, does this also provide access to specialized skills and, and expertise? The answer is yes, as we have said earlier, earlier on. Businesses are now able to hire people with specialized skills and with specialized expertise rather than, of course, having them um, in-house. Businesses are able to outsource some of these um, um, specialized requirements to outsourcing companies outside for a timeline of a period of time during which, of course, um, their, their needs are met and their needs uh, are delivered. We've spoken about focusing on core competencies earlier on. The fourth, of course, is scalability and flexibility. Uh, businesses can scale operations up or they can scale them down now as the need may arise without the burden, of course, of maintaining excess capacity or infrastructure internally in the respective businesses. Now, have there been some challenges around industrial and labor relations to outsourcing? Again, yes, um, the, the, the answer is yes, because people believe that outsourcing can give rise to various industrial and labor relations issues. Some of these issues, of course, include job security. Now, 
um, a lot of people, including unions, believe that the outsourcing arrangement may lead to concerns among workers, you know, about whether or not their job would be secure, you know, especially for those who are in, say, paid employment or permanent employment uh, with businesses. When businesses begin to outsource some of their, um, their functions to outsourcing companies, the tendency, of course, is for employees, even those in the core, core functions or core competencies of the business, to begin to think that even their own roles or their own jobs can eventually or will, will eventually be outsourced. And so this creates the fear of job insecurity. This creates the fear of layoffs. This creates the fear of possible displacement, of course, leading to tension and, of course, dissatisfaction and grievances in the workplace. Um, the second issue is that of wage disparities. Now, outsourcing may result in wage disparities, oftentimes, of course, uh, between employees who are performing similar roles. Uh, outsourced workers you know, receive lower wages and fewer benefits as compared to their uh, counterparts employed directly by the company. Now, this leads, of course, to moral issues and to resentment. I have seen businesses where we have relationship officers employed by the business or sales officers, as they are called somewhere else. Then they also then have an outsourcing company, of course, which also provides um, people with the same set of skills uh, and also performing the same function as either relationship officers or, or, or sales officers. Sometimes they are called canvassers. You know, but, but by whatever name they are called, what they do and the functions they and, and they perform and the job roles that they perform are similar to the job roles of the relationship officer and the sales officer that are employed by the business. But when you look at what they are paid, you find a very significant disparity between what these outsourced employees who are called canvassers, who are doing the same jobs as the sales officers or the relationship officers are doing, uh, are paid compared to what these relationship officers who are employed by the business are paid. Now, Another concern, of course, another industrial and labor relations concern is around um, the working conditions. You know, um, the arrangement or the outsourcing arrangement is believed to sometimes lead to poorer working conditions for outsourced workers, uh, particularly if the labor standards and regulations are not adequately enforced. Now, this may include very long hours of work, you know, the lack of job security, which we spoke earlier on, and of course, limited access to benefits and protections that uh, others have. I have seen businesses where you also have um, outsourced workers, uh, again, performing the same role or the same jobs that shop floor stewards are performing in the plant. And the shop floor stewards employed by the business, you know, have PPEs, you know, personal protective equipment, and the outsourced um, workers do not. And, they are exposed to the same malay in the in the in the factory floor. They are exposed to the same safety challenges in the factory floor. They are exposed, of course, um, um, to the same health challenges, you know, in the factory setting. We have seen it happen in businesses, you know, in Nigeria. Then there's of course trade union opposition. Uh, unions may oppose outsourcing initiatives because they view them as threats to job insecurity, like we said. Um, as threats to wages because wages, I mean, they believe that outsourced employees are not paid adequate wages um, as, you know, um, those who are, of course, uh, employed directly by, by the business. And, of course, they are also concerned about working conditions uh, of their members. So this opposition uh, may sometimes lead to labor disputes. They may lead to labor grievances. They may lead to strikes and other forms of work. In fact, they may lead to what we call go slow in the workplace sometimes, uh, and other forms of uh, industrial action, all of which, of course, disrupt the, the operations of the business and eventually, of course, impact productivity. And when it impacts productivity, it also impacts the P&L, you know, uh, or the balance sheet of the business at the end of the day. Now, here we'll be looking at some of the um, HR challenges, of course, or HR issues relating to outsourcing. Um, and this will include uh, issues around talent management. Uh, and of course, 
the the charge is that HR teams and HR leads in businesses that outsource some of their functions must learn to coordinate, you know, uh, with outsourcing providers to ensure that the right skills are available at the right time and that the outsourced workers are fully aligned with the organization's culture and values. They must ensure that outsourcing companies that provide um, outsourced staff to them are providing staff or employees with the right kind of mindset, with the right kind of skills, with the right kind of competencies, you know, so that they are aligned with the objectives of the business and the goals of the business. And such that they are, they are also able to imbibe, you know, the culture of the business and the values of the business they are working for. The second is workforce plan. As professionals, you know, uh, in HR, we must learn to forecast future talent needs of the business. Uh, this is a key consideration, even when we are going to be outsourcing uh, some of these um, uh, functions out to, to outsourcing companies. So we must consider both internal and external resources to ensure that outsourcing arrangements support business objectives without creating gaps or redundancies, of course, in staffing. Um, then we we'll talk about performance management, that even for outsourced workers, we must establish clear performance metrics and standards, you know, such that the uh, um, team leads are able to monitor their performance. Uh, they're able to provide feedback to the outsourcing company or the outsourcing provider to ensure continuous improvement in service quality and service delivery to the business. And of course, to ensure full alignment with the organizational goals. Um, the last is employee engagement and communication. Now, I must warn that these are by no means, this list is not by no, by no means exhaustive. There are quite a lot more. We've simply just called out a few of them. So as HR professionals, we must implement strategies to keep all employees, including outsourced workers informed. We must keep them engaged and we must keep them connected to the organization's mission, the vision, and the values of the organization. What are the general, general challenges that the outsourcing business uh, is facing in Nigeria? We all know um, the challenge of infrastructure de deficiencies around inadequate infrastructure, including but not limited to unreliable power supply, to poor internet connectivity, to transportation bottlenecks around um, the country. And of course, all of these can together or even singularly hamper outsourcing operations and of course affect the quality of service that outsourcing businesses or outsourcing companies deliver to their clients. There's also the regulatory environment, very complex and evolving regulatory frameworks, uh, including tax policies and the multiplicity of taxes you know, that we have in the country. Yes, there's a committee now set up by the current president, which is reviewing the multiplicity of taxes. But before that is done, like every other business, even those in the outsourcing business suffer, you know, the multiplicity of taxes uh, because of our tax policies. The labor laws themselves are very, uh, very, very old and archaic, and they need to be reviewed, you know, to bring them in tune what, with the growth and the innovations, of course, that the business landscape has, uh, has experienced over the course of several uh, decades. Now, the challenge that all of this does, of course, is the uncertainty and the compliance challenges, of course, that it creates, creates around you know, outsourcing providers and even around their clients. Now, the third is that data security and privacy concerns. Now, um, the risk are very significant. The concerns, of course, around the outsourcing arrangements are particularly around whether or not sensitive information, you know, can be shared with third party providers. You know, and if these sensitive information are shared, what guarantee do businesses have that this sensitive information will also not be shared with parties that are not, I mean, with, yes, with parties that are not party to the contract between the outsourcing company and the business. So we must ensure robust de um, data protection measures 
and compliance, of course, with data privacy regulations um, as an essential to be able to overcome some of the challenges um, facing our sourcing business in, in Nigeria. There are also skills shortages. Uh, so, and despite the large and youthful population that we have in Nigeria, we still face these skill shortages in certain sectors, including even IT. Um, yes, a lot of people are going into IT in Nigeria, but the great talent migration is also seeing quite a huge number of IT specialists migrating from Nigeria to countries like Canada, to the UK, to US, to Australia, and so on and so forth. So we do have a shortage of skill around IT, around engineering, and of course, around certain other professional services. Now, finding and retaining skilled talent can be very challenging for outsourcing providers in the light of what we have enunciated. Now, quality control and service standards. Uh, we must maintain consistent service quality as outsourcing businesses need to maintain consistent service quality to be able to meet the expectation you know, of their clients and of course, the challenging business environment. And particularly, of course, when outsourcing involves, say, offshore providers, you know, also contractors with different standards and practices, uh, just like the international businesses or the international outsourcing companies that we say are now operating in Nigeria. Now, how do we overcome some of these challenges? Our first suggestion is that um, businesses must conduct comprehensive risk assessment. So in doing this, they must consider factors such as infrastructure, as we mentioned earlier, regulatory compliance, data security, cultural differences, and even vendor reliability before they choose you know, their outsourcing partner. Um, they must do strategic partners selection, uh, choosing outsourcing partners carefully based on their expertise, their track record of performance, in areas where they have worked before, um, their financial stability, you know, uh, can they handle um, um, the business that is being given to them? Can they independently, without resort, you know, to relying on the business funding them, are they financially stable to handle whatever outsourcing engagement is handed over to them? This must be uh, a very key con consideration. And then their cultural fit, and of course, their commitment to quality and excellence in service delivery. There must be clear communication and expectation, you know, to be able to overcome this. You must define the role of the outsourcing company. You must also define their responsibilities and what are the deliverables that are expected from them. And after all of this is done, there must be some timelines up front to ensure alignment, of course, and to minimize misunderstanding between the business and the outsourcing uh, vendor. You must also have a very robust governance and oversight function. That is to say, uh, businesses must establish regular reporting uh, metrics between them and the outsourcing company. You must have review meetings. And of course, you must conduct performance evaluation to be able to track the progress you know, of the performance of the outsourcing company and the function, of course, uh, that has been outsourced to them. Uh, you must at all times address issues as they come up and drive continuous improvement. Uh, the last, of course, is the risk mitigation strategy. Uh, this will include, of course, diversifying vendors. So if you plan on um, outsourcing, say, four functions or four key areas of the business, it may be wise to diversify the vendors, you know, rather than give them to just one vendor, um, which may create a challenge for the business, it may be better, of course, to hand, I mean, these areas of the business to more than just one vendor. What that does, of course, for businesses is that you then have the opportunity to compare the performance of these vendors, you know, as against the, as against the other. Of course, um, you must also, of course, implement uh, redundancy measures uh, such that, of course, we also not hurt the, the 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 business. And in doing this, is it possible 
to also have such employees who are affected handed over, you know, uh, to the um, outsourcing business, in which case you are then able to, although you do not have the skill set internally, you are able to have at least have the skill set um, delivered to you, you know, through the outsourcing company. You must establish contingency plans and, of course, secure appropriate insurance coverage in case of any um, uh, unfortunate incident happening uh, or even something that sometimes may be force majeure. Now, what are the emerging trends in our sourcing in Nigeria? We've spoken about digital transformation and the fact that organizations are increasingly leveraging digital solutions to streamline processes uh, to enhance the efficiency and to drive innovation in our sourcing operations. Uh, remote work and telecommuting. Uh, businesses are now embracing virtual work, uh, work from home, hybrid, distributed teams, and remote collaboration tools to facilitate flexible work arrangements and to ensure business continuity without any form of disruption uh, in Nigeria. We now have specialized services and niche markets. Uh, businesses and organizations are now seeking providers with specific expertise in particular industries, uh, specific technologies you know, or functions to help them address unique business needs and to deliver tailor-made solutions effectively uh, to their businesses. Um, the fourth is knowledge process outsourcing. Um, organizations are outsourcing complex analytical and strategic functions to leverage external expertise and to drive decision-making processes. We've said this earlier on. Rather than bog themselves down, you know, with some of this expertise, which can be sourced from outside the business, and uh, to enable them, of course, concentrate on their core areas of competence. Businesses now, of course, um, outsource um, their knowledge process to outsource companies to handle for them. And that way they are able to leverage, you know, the expertise of the outsourcing company. And they use this, of course, to drive their decision-making process. Uh, of course, we now have healthcare outsourcing. It's the reason, of course, why we now have uh, HMOs. And we now have um, healthcare outsourcing businesses that handle medical billings coding, transcription, even telemedicine. Um, uh, Teledoc, Tramendoc, you know, are examples of, of this. And you now have outsourcing businesses that are also, of course, managing health information in the business. I mean, in, in the uh, workplace. And there are opportunities for growth and innovation. Yes. Again, technology solutions and services services exist for software development, for mobile app development, for web development, for cyber security services, for cloud computing, and of course, data analytics services. All of these are opportunities, you know, um, for growth and for innovation. And of course, outsourcing presents these opportunities to businesses. In Nigeria. Businesses can hire people who have skills in all of these areas without necessarily employing them into um, their business. We've spoken about business process uh, outsourcing. We've spoken about knowledge process outsourcing, healthcare outsourcing. And of course, we now have e-commerce and logistics, um, through which, of course, outsourcing providers can help e-commerce companies uh, optimize supply chain operations and enhance customer satis satisfaction. Um, businesses and e-commerce platforms like Chumia you know, um, like Conga, uh, do not necessarily have, you know, um, in their employment, you know, permanent employees who handle some of these things for them. What they do is simply, you know, leverage the availability of outsourcing providers you know, to deliver um, their business in the areas, of course, in which um, they operate. So it's possible to, to order anything online now and have it delivered um, to you. And Conga or Jumia does not necessarily need to have a delivery man who will bring the items you have ordered to you. Uh, they can simply contract an outsource um, agency or business to handle logistics and to handle delivery for them. 
Now, what are the, what are the impacts, you know, of what have been the impact of global events and technological advancements on outsourcing? Um, the first is economic uncertainty. Uh, economic uncertainty may lead to fluctuations in outsourcing demand. Of course, it may lead to um, pricing pressures and shifts, of course, in outsourcing preferences. Now, it may also lead to technological disruption. Uh, advancements such as AI, automation, robotics, cloud computing, and the Internet of Things you know, are reshaping the outsourcing landscape in Nigeria. These technologies are automating repetitive tasks. They are, of course, augmenting human capabilities now, and they are enabling, of course, new outsourcing models and service delivery methods. We've spoken about remote work and telecomputing. Uh, we all know what COVID-19 did. Uh, when, we, when we had to lock down our workplaces, uh, the pandemic, of course, accelerated the adoption of uh, flexible work arrangements, remote work and telecommunicating arrangements in even outsourcing operations. Now, this trend may have lasting impacts on how outsourcing services are delivered with a greater emphasis on virtual work models, distributed teams, and remote collaboration tools. Uh, we've also spoken about data security and privacy concerns. And this is because um, events, you know, and happens around cyber security breaches, data breaches, and privacy scandals are raising concerns, you know, uh, about the security of data, you know, and, and the privacy of uh, the data that um, outsourcing companies uh, are handed or they come about in the course of their relationship with uh, businesses. Now, what do we require stakeholders, you know, um, to do uh, to ensure, of course, uh, that the outsourcing uh, business model is one that also thrives, you know, and one that can deliver quality service to businesses and to organizations on a continuous uh, basis. Our charge to business leaders and decision makers, of course, is that, well, they should embrace outsourcing as a strategic tool for driving the growth of their businesses, for driving innovation and competitiveness in their organizations and their businesses. Now, they must continuously, of course, evaluate outsourcing opportunities across various functions and industries with a view to leveraging, of course, specialized skills, um, access global talent, and of course, optimize resource um, allocation. Secondly, uh, to government and regulatory bodies, our recommendation and our charge, of course, will be that they should promote an enabling environment for outsourcing industry uh, uh, to grow by implementing, of course, policies that are supportive, you know, by, of course, turning out regulatory frameworks and incentives that encourage investment, uh, that encourage innovation, and of course, that encourage um, job creation. Uh, of course, in the business environment. Now, to providers of outsourcing services, they must continuously innovate and they must differentiate their, their offerings to meet the evolving needs of clients and of course, the demands of the market. Now, they must be ready to invest in talent development. They must invent in adoption of technology. They must, in, of course, invest in service quality improvement so that they can deliver value-added solutions you know, to businesses that will, will drive the satisfaction of their client and, of course, will continue to promote the loyalty of their clients or businesses, of course, to them. Now, to our educational institutions and training providers, our charge is that they must develop industry-relevant curricula, um, training programs and certification courses that will equip students that are leaving these schools, you know, and professionals alike with the skills and the competencies needed for success in the outsourcing industry. Now, to employees and job seekers, you know, who approach these outsourcing companies for jobs, our charge is to say seize opportunities for career growth, for skill development, and for professional advancement in the outsourcing industry. You must invest in continuous learning, upskilling, and reskilling 
to remain competitive and relevant in a rapidly evolving uh, job market and environment. Now, to conclude, we would like to share that the vision for the future of our sourcing in Nigeria is one of transformation, it is one of innovation, and it is one of sustainable growth. As far as global leadership is concerned, Nigeria has become a global leader in the outsourcing business. We are known for our expertise, for innovation, and quality of service delivery across diverse industries and functions. Businesses, of course, like Flutter Wave, like Andela, like Interswitch, are doing a lot, you know, um, in the African space uh, and outside Nigeria and globally. And of course, they are leveraging um, the outsourcing model to deliver their services to their clients, you know, whether in fintech, whether in the banking industry. Right. Now, digital transformation, uh, of course, the business, or sorry, the country, of course, is undergoing digital transformation. Um, Nigeria and Nigerians are embracing cutting edge technologies such as AI, such as automation, blockchain, cloud, com uh, cloud computing, with the view, of course, to enhancing the delivery of services to streamline processes and to drive innovation in businesses and organizations in Nigeria. Now, for specialization and niche markets, uh, outsourcing companies are now specializing in niche markets, you know, focusing. Um, back in the days um, in economics, we talked about economies of scale. We, we talked about specialization. That exactly is what is happening now in the outsourcing, I mean, world and to outsourcing companies. Outsourcing companies are now specializing in particular areas. They are now developing niche markets for themselves, you know, and the essence of all of this is to be able to add very high value, you know, uh, to services that they are providing. Services such as knowledge process outsourcing, uh, healthcare outsourcing, fintech solutions, creative services, and of course, uh, green outsourcing. There's a lot more that is happening in the outsourcing um, business. Uh, I'm sure that the slides, these slides when we, when we share them, will simply, of course, elicit, you know, um, the desire for our listeners to go and read a lot more about the outsourcing business model in Nigeria and how it is working, what are the challenges that the, um, the, the outsourcing industry is facing. How are these challenges being addressed? Are these outsourcing companies adding value to businesses in Nigeria? All of these, of course, we can find uh, when we do some additional reading around the uh, outsourcing business model in Nigeria, you know, and the challenges that come with outsourcing. Thank you very much for listening. I'd like to take questions uh, from and comments, of course, from participants on the call. Um, over thank to you, you, Yemi. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Ahmed Ladan Gubir, a fellow of the Charter Institute of Personnel Management of Nigeria. That was a very, very brilliant presentation. If you agree with me, if you're on this call, you can indicate by clapping your virtual hands or thumbs up. Let us appreciate Mr. Ahmed Ladan Gubir for this wonderful presentation. Uh, please let's let's show him some love. 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 Um, Yemi Adeoshu, the uh, presenter and moderator for this particular program, uh, is having some difficulties to, I mean, joining back. So I will be um, taking chat for the meantime, hoping that he will come back uh, um, to join us. Otherwise, we'll just continue so that we can make the best use of our time. Right now, um, it's time for questions. If you do have questions, please uh, feel free to raise your hand and we will be able to, um, you know, recognize you to be able to speak. But first, I'm going to take some questions from the chat room before I uh, open the floor for the live audience. So let me quickly take some questions from the chat room. I have a question from Nini Bamidele. We'll take it one after the other so that we can see how far we could go this evening. So Nini Bamidele is asking, is there any benefits under the Employee Compensation Act that caters for third party employee who works in production or operation floor 
in the event of accident, which leads to partial or permanent disability while at work. So me is asking if there's any provision in the Employee Compensation Act that covers outsourced um, employees, especially for those in the manufacturing or production environment when they do um, get involved in any form of workplace accidents on the shop floor. Over to you, Alaji. Okay. Um, th thank you very much, Ni, for that question. Um, I may not be able to reference the particular uh, section of the Employee Compensation Act, what used to be called the Workmen Compensation Act. But yes, the ECA does cover third-party employees in the workplace. Um, when accidents happen in the workplace, uh, of course, out outsourcing businesses are uh, expected, you know, to um, subscribe to and make contributions to um, the uh, national, uh, the Nigerian Social um, Insurance Trust Fund, with the view to, of course, being able to pay such compensations um, when you have accidents or injuries in the work in the workplace. Now, the ECA is not only meant for permanent employees of the businesses that are contracting these outsourcing agencies. The outsourcing agencies themselves are also expected, you know, just like the law expects them to make pension contributions for their employees. It is the same way the law, the Employee Compensation Act, also expects them, you know, to um, uh, also expects them, of course, to make con Okay, seems um, Mr. Gubir is also having some technical issues. We just um, wait for a few minutes. I think he's still here. Let's just give a few minutes for him to come back uh, into the meeting. Um, Okay, seems um, the network. We actually have a lot of people who are waiting um, in the you know uh, meeting room to try to join this meeting, but the meeting has reached its full capacity of hundred people. But not to worry, we will uh, apologize to everyone who um, are trying to join the meeting. We will ensure that um, the um, meeting recording is immediately made available on YouTube. Um, immediately after um, we are done. So let's try to get um, Mr. Gubir back into the meeting. Let's try to get him back into the meeting. Let's try to get him back into the meeting. Um, okay. Just a minute. Let's try to see if we can get him back into this meeting. All right. We will we'll try to see if we can get him back into the meeting. Just a few minutes. Just a few minutes. Hello, Mr. Ajayi. Hello. Hello, Mr. Ajayi. I will be with you. I'll be with you. Okay, I will meet Hello. you now. Hello, Mr. Ajayi. Yes, Dr. Loyede, I'm here. Yeah. I'm trying to get him back into the meeting. He's back now. Let me okay. communicate. Yes, please. One of us sent uh, left something in the chat. Mrs. Emodi, she works with NSITF. She said she would like yes. to get more like. Yes, 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 yes. I can see All that. Right. I can see that. All right. I can see that. All right. Just That's let me get the back. Thank All right. you. All right.
Okay. Th- thank you very much, uh, Yemi. Yes, sir. I think I'm, I'm, I'm back in now. My apologies. Uh, the network yanked me off for a while. I, I think Mrs. Uh, sorry, at what point? Um... Okay, so you were answering the question around if um, outsource employees, if they enjoy benefit of getting compensation in the case of, in the event of accident, you know, in the workplace, as well as those that are in the production uh, shop floor. Um, so you were trying to provide answer to that particular question. You were almost done answering that question. Exactly. Okay. I, I think I was, my closing remarks was, of course, that yes, the ECA does cover our source employees in the workplace. And that when accidents happen, um, their employers are expected, of course, to leverage contributions to through the ECA to the NSITF to pay compensation for uh, such kind of employees. But like Dr. Oluyede said, we're glad that Mrs. Emodi is on the call. Uh, I'm sure as an NSITF staff, she'll be able to also help us uh, provide uh, some insight into this. Yes, I thank will. You. Uh, thank you very much, sir. I will reach out to uh, Mrs. Emodi shortly. Let's just take one or two, one other question so that she'll be able to contribute to both questions um, together appropriately once we're done. So the second question, is there any benefit under the, okay, sorry. Um, Okay, as an as an from this from Telia Dean, as an employee engagement lead in an outsourcing organization, what strategies would you advise we put in place to keep people engaged and motivated, especially if the if the pay is not typically encouraging? So um, once you answer that question, I'll then bring in Mr. Modi to make a contribution as we move on. Over to you, sir. Are you there, sir? Okay, while we wait for um Mr. Gubir, let's uh Mrs. Uh, Toy Emiodi. Oh, okay. Um, I need to unmute him. Let me unmute Mr. Gubir. Okay, let's do this. One minute. Okay, sir, you can unmute now. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Th 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 thank you. Um, the matter of the or the issue of um, remuneration, you know, um, outsourcing agencies are businesses like any other business. And I think, um, as I was speaking earlier on, I did mention the fact that part of the challenges or the fear that people have is that when you outsource um, some particular functions to um, outsourcing agencies, the tendency is that they do not pay the same kind of wage for the same job or the same role, you know, um, as as it is paid to businesses or to to, to employees, sorry, by, I mean, as it's paid by businesses to employees who are in the same kind of role, but in the direct employment of the business. Now, uh, in my experience, what I have seen, and particularly in places where I've worked outside Nigeria, is that the businesses insist on what the outsourcing agency must pay their employees. Now, this is negotiated during, of course, the, the, the period of, um, uh, of the negotiation to contract the outsourcing agency. Now, they even insist that, look, for what we call contributions to the employee compensation at the Nigeria to NSITF, social security, I mean, uh, contributions, for contributions of pension, they agree you know, with the outsourcing agency that this must be paid and you must show evidence of the fact that you have made this payment. So what will be paid by the outsourcing agency sometimes is agreed between the outsourcing agency and the business. You cannot pay any employee that you are deploying to work in our business 
anything less than X, Y, Z. And you must meet, of course, the pension payments, this all statutory payments as we pay for our employees. It is the way that I have seen businesses address um, the challenge of outsourcing companies and outsourcing agencies not wanting to pay their employees the right wage for even when the public, you know, receive from the contracting business uh, the right kind of payment or the equivalent payment for, for the role. So my response would be yes, um, these challenges exist, but if you work in such an agency, it is to encourage you know, your employers to negotiate for the right kind of remuneration and wage from their client, of course, for employees who work in, in your business, who are then deployed you know, to these other businesses. But lots of things are, are happening. Um, such employees, of course, can probably only get protection you know, from, from unions if they have. In my experience, even though they are outsourced employees or workers, they belong to unions and their unions, of course, protect them. Uh, I don't you. know if I've answered that question uh, very well. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Mrs. Tony Amiodi, please let's have your contribution. Please unmute yourself. Let's have your contribution to this from, I mean, as an employee of NSITF. Please share some knowledge in addition to this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, dear all, and good evening to our dear guest speaker. And he has mm -hmm. actually done justice to the question, actually. I was just going to add that, let's take note that employees do not contribute to the employee compensation scheme. Employers contribute on behalf yeah. of the employees. Yeah. That is very important as a takeaway. Please let everyone make know that employees do not contribute. Employers pay on behalf of the employees. And I guess we can say it all. Um, it is compulsory that as source companies register the employer's key in to the scheme and do exactly what their parent body is doing or what the companies that uh, assault them in, are doing for their own employer employees also. And for the second question, he answered it correctly. All statutory obligations should be met and also the HMO, all other things, even though their pay is small, there are other things that come in, like he had said, that will cushion the effect and make them work diligently. Also, the reward system is also key, very important also. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, you Thank you very you. much, Ma. Let's quickly recognize Okori Awakalu. Okori Awakalu, you can unmute to speak. Okori Awakalu. Please go ahead and unmute. Ask the okay. question. Please Thank take you. Your points. You can take as many questions. Thank you. Yes, my question is um, just quite straightforward. Thank you to the presenter for a good job. I wanted to, if you can speak into conversion. We have seen a situation where the company where the employee is being assessed to is being converted to their main staff. Like, you know, initially the person came in as an employee. Along the line, the, the company is being seconded to probably big interest. You know, I want to convert that person to their employee. So I'd like the, you know, the presenter, the speaker, to help speak into this and how best it can be handled. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you very much. I'm going to share two experiences again that I've had uh, in businesses that I've worked. Um, I am not aware that there's any law that says um, an outsourced employee who is deployed to a business cannot be absorbed into the business permanently. Perhaps what needs to happen is for the two business businesses, the, the, the employer and the outsourced business to have a conversation you know, um, around this. Earlier on, I spoke about a situation where you have relationship officers, sales officers, you know, who work for the business, and then those who are called canvassers, who are performing the same roles for these people. But of course, you do have some disparity, you know, you do have some disparity in the, um, in the remuneration, of course, of the outsourced employee, and of course, the, th those who are in the permanent employment of, of the business. Now, I have seen a situation where at the point, at the time at which the business then decided you know, 
to recruit additional relationship officers, you know, or sales officers into the business. The first place they went to were to the, this outsource employees they called canvassers because they already have the experience of the business. They were just not direct employees and they went to recruit, you know, uh, from there. Now, because they probably require a lot more, they then, they then got the outsourcing agency, of course, to employ more canvassers that are all, that were also eventually deployed um, to them. My second experience um, with this, and of course, this 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 um, this is slightly different. Was of course outside Nigeria when I when I when I used to work in Zambia. You ha you have a, a situation where, like I did say, the outsourcing employees from the outsource business. Um, or from the outsourcing company, but were members of a union, even though the business which is employing their employer, you know, does not even have a union. And then for some disagreements that they had with their own em employer, that's the outsourcing agency. They went on strike, practically crippled you know, the operations of the business because they were in what we call critical roles in the, in, the, in the plant, practically crippled the business. What I understand that the business eventually did was to look at those critical roles that they have, you know, and they look at outsourced employees, you know, holding such critical roles. And then they approached the outsourcing agency to say, look, we actually want to employ these people into a permanent. Yeah. And by the time they employed about 125 of them, they made sure they had placed them in these critical roles, you know. And what that did, of course, for them is that one, they have people who have the right kind of skill set to work in the business at all times. They are not unionized. So even if the employees of the outsourcing company decide to go on strike some other time, you know, it will not affect the, the critical areas of the operations because they have decided to now recruit people from the outsourcing agencies who are the experience, who are actually doing this job before to fill this, um, um, to fill this uh, vacancy. So um, that is, those are two examples, you know, that, that come to mind. So like I said, I'm not aware that there's any law that says businesses cannot recruit, you know, or, or take on employees from outsourcing agencies who are already working for them or who have been deployed to them, you know, uh, to work in their businesses. Thank you um, very much, sorry. sir. Thank you very much, sir. At this point, I'll be handing over back to Oluyemi Adi Oshun to take it off from here. Um, I think I'll continue, sir. I'm okay. you. Yeah. Okay, all right. Thank, thank you very much. Sir. Okay, thank you very much. So um, on that note, let me quickly um allow um Ahmed Kwajafa. You can unmute now. Ahmed Kwajafa. Please straight to the point, ask your question. Ahmed Kwajafa. Thank you very much, Sam Moderator. I'm quite appreciative of uh, your moderation and then the one of the guest speaker is quite excellent and uh, exciting. Um, my concern is that why do we know these presidential aspirants only when they come to campaigns? When they are there, they have erudite uh, CVs, and we don't hear them. Then I will invite. Um, let me quickly re um, invite Mirate um, C Adebayo, please. Questions on the topic that we are discussing and straight to the point, please. Nireti Adibayo, you can unmute. Nireti Adibayo, are you there? Okay, if Nireti is not ready for us, let me take uh, Mrs. Chidi OBAJC. You can unmute to ask your question. Thank you, um, Thank you very much. And thank you to Alaji for that. Um insightful presentation. My concerns are this. Um, he talked about quality assurance and control. We find out that um, most of the outsourcing firms, 
the ability to maintain a particular standard of skilled employee is quite challenging. Take, for instance, the ones, the security companies that we outsource securities to. You find out that they come in and promise, make a lot of promises, and maybe the first batch of employees deployed to your site seem to be exactly the standard agreed on. But as a couple of months down the line, especially when they have to change the employees, they find it difficult to get that standard of employees. What you then find is that People are deployed to your sites that look like they are just picked up the street and immediately just hand uniform on them and ask to be on your site without even knowing the basic rules of what they are supposed to do. What do you think about this? Because that is actually affecting our impression about the outsourcing industry, particularly for this one, even when you get those who claim to be professional and understand what the job is about. Thank you. Yes, uh, that's, that's, all right. Th thank you very much, Mrs. Uh, Obia Jesse. The relationship between our sourcing companies and the businesses they work for are contractual. Just like an employment relationship between an employee and an employer are contractual. You must be able to give me what we agreed you will give. If you don't do that, it means you are, already, you are breaching the terms of our engagement and the terms of our contract. Oftentimes, what happens is that as HR professionals, we, we tend to look the other way, even when we know that what is happening is not right. You engage an outsourcing company. You agree on the quality of manpower that are supposed to be deployed to your, to, to your workplace. You agree on the skill sets that are to be deployed, you know, um, to your workspace. And at the end of the day, you get less than you deserve and you look the other way. It is a business at the end of the day that suffers, you know, this act that we do as HR managers or HR, HR professionals. So my point and my response you know, to, your, to your question will be that hold outsourcing agencies you know, to their contractual obligations to you, your business as their employer. In answering the question around the ECA earlier on, I alluded to the fact that I am aware of businesses that will insist that outsourcing agencies must show evidence that they have paid the pension contributions of their employees. They have paid the social security contributions, what we call the NSITF contributions here in Nigeria, of their employees to the relevant agencies of government before you know, the employer will pay for the month. For example, if the pay for May is what is due, you must show proof that you've made all the contributions, you know, as far as pension contributions, as far as social security contributions for the month of April for your employees before my business, the business I work for, will pay you your, your invoice for the month of May. Those are the kind of checks, you know, that we put in there. Now, Having said that, you must also insist on the quality of people that are deployed to your workplace. Because the quality of personnel or skill set that are deployed to your workplace invariably, of course, affects your productivity, as we said later on, and eventually also impacts your bottom line, your PL and your balance sheet when productivity, um, uh, when productivity drops. So it is our responsibility as HR professionals, you know, to insist that outsourcing agencies must give us what we contractually agreed. Anything short of that is going to hurt our business. And the good news now is that the outsourcing agencies in Nigeria now have, of course, an association. They now have an employer association, you know, called EPN. 
you know, um, employers association, you know, for providers of, uh, uh, I can't remember the full name now, but the the the, the initials are E A P E A N, you know, which they launched uh, sometimes last last month. They now have an employers association. The essence of that, registered by the Federal Ministry of Labor, the essence of all of that, and the reason they they did that too is for them to be able to regulate what happens in their industry. You know, so but we owe it a duty as HR professionals to ensure that what we contract or what our businesses contractually agree with our sourcing agencies are what are delivered to us. If they do anything short of that, we must be the ones crying foul that this is not what we agreed. And we must be the ones holding them to account, you know, for not, uh, I mean, keeping their own um, end of the bargain that we have. After all, they will expect that at the end of the month, as a business, we will pay their invoices. Thank you very much. That will be my very honest, honest response, Mrs. OBHC. Thank you very much. I hope um, you, Mr. Bidu, back with us. well answered. Thank, Thank you. you. So let's quickly take Niriti Adebayo. Niriti Adebayo, then I'll go back Thank to you. the chat room to take some questions. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Mitter. Uh, Mr. Gobiri, thank you for that eloquent presentation. Um, it shows a lot of uh, experience and uh, in-depth knowledge of the outsourcing industry. Um, I work in this industry and I've been here for 14 years. Um, with uh, my experience in industry, what I have observed is the low barrier to entry where you have um, low or unqualified portfolio managers who call themselves um, outsourcing com com companies. And yet exactly. we do not have the regulatory bodies who oversee this. It's supposed to be done by the Federal Ministry of Labor. But I have, um, we've had several meetings with them as well to say that, look, they need to um, check our compliance and ensure that we have the right companies with the right qualifications to be able to manage people. That's one. Secondly, is the attitude of first Nigerians who see people as numbers and not as assets. And so what drives us are our unethical tendencies. We have service level agreements with our principals and the principals will not check if these agreements have been adhered to strictly. And then okay. we turn around and people do not pay the right, you know, compensation to staff. And we've seen that several times. We've seen organizations who are supposedly to be ethical, but they owe several PFAs to their staff. And the reason is that the staff are not even able to question why their PFAs are not being paid. And I think it's the fact that such organizations do not have quality personnel to an extent where they can also stand for themselves. And again, I would like to talk a bit about the ECA. The ECA is the responsibility of the outsourcing companies. Yeah. So it is when we are able to do the right things that we can begin to ask for increment. Now the outsourcing company is supposed to start to really remit all the taxes, remit CA, NSITF, ITF, pensions, and all the likes. Now, the, like I said, there's no regulatory body that checks that. Even the principals do not check it, and they look away and take excuses. That's one. And then somebody talked about empowering the staff. Yes, there are some ways to empower our staff. Financial empowerment. We create cooperative schemes, asset acquisition schemes, so in a way that they can, you know, have um, access to funds that they can actually use. Now, outsourcing is not just about numbers. We must have the interest, we must have the commitment, and we must have the ethics to be able to run a proper outsourcing company. But until we have that body, and that's why I'm so happy that Mr. Gobiru is here speaking to me today. And I'm hoping that if by God's grace he becomes the president, he would be able to continue the work that the present president is doing to ensure that there is proper regulation and we, we, we stop the low barrier to entry into outsourcing industry. And that is if we are sure we want to take outsourcing to the next level. Now, he spoke, some, he spoke about um, automation, artificial intelligence, and the rest of it. 
I also know that a few outsourcing companies have scaled to HR tech companies, and my company is one of that. And that's what I'm saying, that there has to be some certain level of investment in the business. And we must see this investment, it must align with the goals and purpose of the regulatory body or bodies that are responsible for that. I've been in Hukapan before it became EPN for at least 14 years. I know that we are still struggling with low barriers to entry. I'm a member of the CIPM, and I strongly believe that with these two bodies aligning with the Federal Ministry of Labor, we can challenge the Federal Ministry of Labor not to leak away and do the right thing. NSITF have a role to play. When we pay to NSITF, they have a fee to it that they pay the premiums to staff who need them. We've had several meetings with NSITF. So what I'm saying in essence is that there has to be a collaborative approach to ensure that outsourcing is doing the right thing and we are getting the impact. And if we continue to take all the critical roles from outsourcing, then it just means that we'll continue to have you know, low barrier to entry and people will begin to look down on the level of staff that we have. I always say that outsourcing can be done at several levels. We have senior levels that we've outsourced to organizations. We have middle management, we have outsourced organizations and are handling critical role. Again, it's the competence, the experience that we must bring to bear. And I believe that CIPM and its leadership have a great role to play in this. I'll just stop here. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very, very much for that wonderful contribution. That was splendid. Thank you very much. Let me quickly go to the chat room and take some more questions. We'll begin to narrow down and wind down um, gradually in a few minutes. And uh, let me just quickly take some questions from the chat room. I'll take like three, you know, so uh, Mr. Gubri can just note them so that we answer them all together. Um, one is with a drive, for the unions to have outsourced personnel unionized, how does this affect the dynamics of business, industrial relations for both the employees and the employer? I'll take that again. With the drive for the unions to have outsourced personnel unionized, how does this affect dynamics of business and industrial relations for both the employers and the outsourced service providers, you know, well as well as the various unions? The second one, so that you take them together in quick succession. Um, somebody is just a comment, outsourcing only actually benefits the organization and leaves a workplace slavery kind of relationship with no recourse to the organization as, as every issue is deflected back to the outsourced company. Therefore, we often find that outsourced staff are not happy workers and are not as committed as compared to direct employees. That was a comment from... Um, one of our um, friends here, that is two, two, uh, two, two. That's from two, two. Um, let me see. Should the union be negotiating salary increment for outsourced staff? Should the unions be negotiating salary increment for outsourced staff? What NJIC supports this? I mean, this action that is Nigerian Judicial Council, do they support this action? That's a question from Lassisi Balogun. Should the unions be negotiating salary increment for outsourced staff? Um, and the last question that I will take from the chat room here before I allow you to answer them and come back to begin to wind down to the next segment. Um, let me see. Let me see. I want to pick the last question. So at least, okay, I think we are fine. We are fine. All right, so let's take those two questions and then um, I will take on a summary. Over to you, sir. Okay, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Yemi. Uh, let me start from the last question around whether the union should be negotiating salaries for household staff. Uh, I'm sure uh, perhaps Ms. Adibaya will be able to speak more what actually uh, um, applies um, to the outsourcing industry here in, in Nigeria. In other climes where I have worked, like I did say, even for outsourced staff, um, I, I worked in a business outside Nigeria, um, which of course was in the mines. And in that country, 
the the biggest union well there were two very big unions uh, one was called nums the other one the other well, the other one was called was num that was the the the, the initials and then the other one was called nums n u m z uh, of course there are national union of mine workers and the national union of mine you know and other other related uh, employer groups and employees of the outsourced company were members of this union in fact members not even one some were members of one of one union the, some part of them were members of another union and they belonged to the same outsourced employer or outsourced uh, nation meanwhile the company for which they provide service does not even have a union they were not unionized what they had in the business was a joint consultative committee as opposed to a union so the unions were the ones negotiating you know wages with the outsourcing company not with the employer now for their members so yes it does happen i do not know what exactly happened in nigeria maybe mrs adibai will be able to speak you know to that but i'm saying that in other climes and if it happens in other climes you know i will be surprised if um i'll be surprised if um it is not because these countries that i'm speaking about to are also common law countries and of course their laws are similar to the laws that we have in nigeria so i'll be surprised if our own laws you know also does not allow them to unionize the reality may be different but it may not be it may not necessarily be because the law does not allow allow it you know the reality on ground may be completely different that would be my response you know to that so in other claims the unions negotiate salaries on behalf of outsource staff with the outsourcing agency not with the principal and that's Thank the point that i'm trying to make you know exactly now um how does unionization of our source personnel affect the dynamics of uh, of um the business i alluded to an example you know um earlier on uh, about how the fact that this the outsource employees were members of union and how in a day they woke up one day and decided that look we are going to down tools now because they are the ones in the critical roles you know they practically crippled the operations of the business for over one week and what happened the principal of course had to then call their employer you know to say that these are what we are hearing in fact in that country as i speak the minister of labor had to come to that location and the employer had to then show evidence that this is what we are paying this was what we agreed you know with the agency and this was what they told us they were going to pay their employees you know it is news to us that they are not paying what they told us they were going to pay it is news to us that they are not making regular contributions to the pension agency on behalf of their employees it is news to us that they are also not in you know um the social security contributions on behalf of their employees of course what they then had to do was to then say okay we will better oversight this going forward and that's how the idea of you must show proof if you submit an invoice for me you must show proof that you have paid the salaries of april you must show proof that you have made the pension contributions of april for these household employees you must show proof that you have also made 
the social security contributions, you know, and remitted all the tax that you're supposed to remit on behalf of these employees before we will settle your May bill. That was the kind of oversight that they then had to ensure that um, this happened. What the reality is um, in Nigeria, um, I do not have the facts and I would not want to hazard a guess. But whether or not this then affects the dynamics of the business environment. Of course, if you have a source staff, um, I mean, um, who are unionized, the tendency is that if they do have an issue with their employer and the principal does not call the employer to order when it comes to their, I mean, to its attention, if they can, the tendency is that it is the business of the principal that will suffer eventually from whatever actions that these outsourced employees take or their union leads them to eventually take. So yes, of course, as far as business relations is concerned, a unionized outsourced employee can hurt the business of the principal. Thank you very much, sir, for that brilliant contribution. Let's quickly take uh, Sabu. Sabu, please, you can um, unmute yourself now. Sabu. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Jay, yes. good evening. Good evening, Sabu. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, good evening. Good evening, uh, Dr. Sabu. Uh, Thank you, sir. My question is, let me go straight. I have a, a case at hand, which I'm going to place it under outsourcing, sir. Uh, the issue is that we employ our staff. Uh, it happens that the GM sent to me, the Sunny, let's consider this guy as a contract staff, because I think Italy, they give instruction of a little embargo, and we need to fill in that position. So I instruct uh, the outsource agent to recruit that, which they formally did all the necessary things, considered the guy, and already the GM says, when yeah, termination period, which I believe to be is around uh, May, this May, other 10 or 15 they are about, we are close to the expiring time. So now he sent me a mail, he's telling me that Sunny, uh, I recommend that that person should be renewed as a contract staff. So I now say I need a clarification, which normally we communicate at evening time so that we can be able to have other uh, words of call or anyhow to find a way to make a call. So I now tell him to clarify that since he gives that experience, he give one year uh, stipulated period of that appointment. So I advise, since he indicated that, while the rest of the, we normally recruit like this based on the jobs that we need, need to put a regular staff because international normally, there are numbers they specify to allow each country to consider as regular staffs. So I now tell him that the only things I will advise that since you give the duration of one year, let's combat this guy to direct international staff. He say, um, signing my reason is we have number of outsourced, uh, outsourced staff which they come earlier before this guy. So I have a prohibition before September to enlist some numbers which we are planning to regularize them. So also this one I want to include inside that future plan. So I say no problem, sir. Since you say so, let me contact the main person, the main agent. We resolve the issue, I'll get back to you. Believe you me, Alaja Ahmed, now I come across this course today, which I am yet to discuss with the, with the, with the uh, outsource company. So advise me which area shall I follow? Because already I know the casualization in Nigeria and I know the process. And the, the number of the outsource agent, it hasn't reached to the number that they can be able to establish union that they can fight such kind of things. But I do within my jurisdictions to make sure that I'm guiding and helping 
to actualize the sanity in the climate of that organization. So, sir, I need that advice for this standing situation. Okay, thank you very much, um, Sabio. So, Mr. Gobir, um, before you answer that question, let me quickly read this. I say this is from um, Onapo Chris. As a trade unionist, I have negotiated salaries for several outsourced employees just to support the answer to the other question. So uh, let's quickly answer this question as uh, I'll take one or two more before we round up. Okay. The next uh, th thank you very much, Jamie. Um, uh, Dr. Sabio, thank you very much for the scenario that you um, just painted. Um, I had said earlier on that even where you have outsourced employees and principals find that the outsourced employee can probably feel uh, a critical vacancy. What they need to do is go through the employer of this outsourced staff to say, we have found in one of your employees a critical skill set, you know, and we want to recruit this person. But you do not go behind his employer to go and try to recruit this employee. That would be unethical. And that can also create issues and problems for, for the, the principal. Um, in your own case, now, I must think that, or I, I would think that, like, say, your, your MD have said, the intention is to take this person on when you probably have an additional vacancy, given the fact that um, right now, because of, say, the lead on your head count, you probably are not able to immediately take him on. But your MD thinks that the skill set that this individual possesses is one that is critical to the business. And if we do not do anything about it now, some other business may just take on this guy. To prevent that from happening, he wants to find a way, you know, to keep this person in the business until such a time when he can then, you know, of course, um, through the employment agency, you know, through the uh, outsourcing company, then permanently recruit this person into the business. I do not think he's doing anything wrong. You know, what is important is to ensure that due, you do due process. I mean, due process is followed exactly, and you do your due diligence in in doing this. And I do not think you will also be infracting any law, you know, in in doing that. So yes, if you do have the opportunity um, to do that, given what you have, the scenario you have printed, I think it is possible to go ahead, of course, and engage this individual, albeit extend his contract as an outsourced staff until say September, when you said you probably will have the vacancy to take on, you know, an additional headcount. And then you have your conversation before then with the outsourcing agency. And at the end of the day, you absorb this person into the employment of your business. Those will be my views Thank around the scenario. You Thank you painted. very much. Thank you very much, sir. I will take three people in quick succession, and that will be all for this segment. So um, we'll take Chris Onapo. After Chris Onapo, we will take Chidi OBJC. Then we will then um, end with uh, Mrs. Niri Timi Adebayo. So Chris Onapo, please, you can unmute and make your contributions quickly. Okay, thank you, uh, my fellow. I'll be very, very swift because uh, Alaji have done a lot of work in uh, handling this issue. Uh, like I said in the comment session, I have negotiated several collective bargaining agreements uh, uh, with outsourced companies. And uh, before 2010, it was terribly bad. 
I could remember as a trade unionist, we got into a place and we saw like almost three outsourcing companies for meaning company A, the parent body, outsourced to this, this outsourced to this, this outsourced to this. And when we got to the negotiating table, we first of all cleared the, cleared the two out of the road and dealt with the first outsourcing the company, original. the original, so that we can uh, really negotiate. Uh, I think the challenge we have, and we need to continue to advocate, the Federal uh, Ministry of Employment and uh, 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 Labor and Employment have a lot of oversight to do. Alaji, you were talking about uh, Zambia, which is South Africa. The South African continent, when it comes to sourcing, they are not doing badly in terms of protecting their workers. Yes. But when you come to Nigeria, it is terrible. It, very few outsourcing companies pay the statutory deductions. Get, if you pick 10 workers, seven, eight will let you know that they left and they've not paid pension, they've not paid tax, they've not paid anything. And I guess that's why somebody was asking if they were protected by the ECA because of the unfair labor practices that is happening. So we as an institute i guess we need to keep engaging particularly the federal ministry of labor and see how much support we can give them in their oversight and if possible uh draft uh, some documents that since the since there's now an association for this uh a source company draft a, a policy document that can uh, really guide their operation so that, like the scenario you mentioned in South Africa, where the labor minister had to come to say, oh, sorry, where is the, where, what did you agree? And they say, ah, no, you are not doing what you are supposed to do. Except in the oil and gas, where the Ministry of Labor has drafted certain things that they protect workers to a level. Most other industries is just so help us God. So that would be my uh, submission to that. Thank you very Thank much, you Chris. Very much, Thank you very much, Chris. All right, Mrs. OBJC. Thank you, um, Yemi, for that. And uh, my comment is just around what uh, Nimeshi Adebayo said last time when she spoke. She spoke very passionately and expressed some level of frustration. And what I thought of is that the parties involved, fortunately herself and the speaker, happen to be members of Fukapan or even the new, the new body right now. And same with Chris. So I think that a lot of education and advocacy will help. Beyond the multinationals and the oil companies, the truth is that for the SMEs, most organizations are sourced just to save costs, not even because they cannot get those skills, but just because it's going to be cheaper. So it then happens to be whoever is the cheapest vendor, whoever offers them the, the cheapest price is the person they take in. And they don't even get to monitor what are these people supposed to pay? Are they doing the right thing or not? So, but if the bodies involved begin to do a lot of education and sensitization around these areas, you will then find out that the companies themselves will begin to demand these things and that would help. And like she said, the entry level is low. Someone's cousin is, um, needs a job and you just say, okay, I need cleaner. They gather some people and bring. But when the company themselves, the host company themselves realize that they have a responsibility and that they are liable if anything happens. I believe that they will begin to be more conscious. So I suggest we take up a lot of advocacy, education, and sensitization in this area. Thank you. I just thought I should pass that. Thank you. Thank you very, very much uh, for that contribution. Um, on that note, I'm going to allow Alaji to just say a few things to as we close this segment, and then we'll move on to the next segment. Okay. Um, um, again, I, I think um, Chris has said a lot, um, uh, shared a lot about my, my thoughts about outsourcing in, in Nigeria. Um, I think the, the opportunity for growth um, does exist. exist. We have um, some very good transformation happening. And like I did say earlier on, it appears now that the Employers Association 
of course, for outsourcing companies now that they have an association. They've always had an association. But of course, now, again, they are properly registered with the Federal Ministry of Labor. Um, they have a certificate. Um, they will have a code of professional conduct outside of even what the law says. So they will be able to regulate themselves. What will happen eventually is also that now that there's an employer's association, there's also likely to be, to I mean, eventually also have a union of our source employees. It may not, it may be one union, it may be a number of unions, like I said, um, is happening in Southern Africa, you know, just like uh, Chris also alluded to. Um, so uh, we will then begin to witness some continuous improvement you know, um, as far as the outsourcing business is concerned. These improvements, of course, will be both to the benefit of the principal, the employer, to the benefit of the outsourcing agency, and to the benefit, of course, of those employees who also work for the um, outsourcing agency. Um, this is a conversation, like Mr. BHC said, that we must continue to have, and uh, advocacy, is also key to ensuring that, of course, we bring improvements to the outsourcing business um, in Nigeria. It's it's something that I'm very passionate about, um, maybe because of my industrial relations background, uh, and it's something that I think I'll continue to speak about at every fora and at every opportunity that I have to do so. Um, let me thank the coordinator for giving me the opportunity to speak to our, you know, um, our professional colleagues on the call tonight. At the last count, I saw a hundred and something plus people on the call. Uh, I'm glad that we were able to share knowledge um, tonight, and uh, we will continue to use uh, this platform um, whenever you invite us, of course. Uh, to share knowledge with uh, our professional colleagues in the uh, in the HR business. Thank you very much, Yemi uh, Ajayi um, and Yemi Adi Oshu. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank you very Alanji. much, sir. Uh, I'll hand over to Yemi Adi Oshu. Thank you okay, so much, Ade Yemi Ajayi. Please be on standby. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll call it a wrap on this session, but we are moving to another session right away.